Microsoft was so smart to handle their communication that their communication was not just communicating about Microsoft pro product, but was about, I would say, uneducating people about digital culture. So if you are used to Microsoft messages, Microsoft messages are so nicely, also smartly uh, designed that they not only explain you some stuff, but they uneducate you about the general right, digital rights and so on. I mean, Microsoft is really a smart company. It's really a smart company. Uh, which doesn't mean that I appreciate what Microsoft is doing, but uh, they, uh, they, in, in terms of marketing, they, they employ some of the smartest marketing guys around. Their uh, PR agency, which is not very well known, is called Wagner Edstrom, is uh, based in Seattle. Uh, it's, a very, it's a boutique uh, uh, PR agency, and the lady that owns the agency is an incredibly smart lady that has the luck to be, uh, she has been uh, uh, a schoolmate of Bill Gates. Uh, so she was hired because she was a schoolmate of Bill Gates. She's a very smart PR lady and she has only one customer, Microsoft. But you can imagine what it means to be the PR agency of Microsoft Corporate. One customer is enough to maintain the agency, of course. And, uh, and, and she's really smart, a smart lady. Uh, they have, uh, in addition to the internal, staff at Microsoft headquarters. They have 50 people working at Wagner Edstrom only to craft messages and to do PR for Microsoft. So it's, if you are and, and, and pay smart people, at the end you are smart in what you're doing. Uh, our big advantage, I think, is that we can be as smart as Microsoft because luckily, uh, neurons have no frontiers, so it's not, you, neurons are not just placed in Seattle and Redmond. Uh, and we can, uh, we, we have the opportunity of outsmarting Microsoft because uh, we do not have the corporate culture that limits our creativity. The corporate, see you later. Uh, the, the corporate culture is a limitation in many, in many senses, in many cases, to creativity. So we have an opportunity, and let's see how we can have the opportunity of outsmarting Microsoft in creating messages about the real office. It's not easy, you can do that. So the message is. It's a complicated story. Uh, if people think, if there's anyone that thinks that when I say something, you, understand, you all understand the same thing, forget about it. So I think there are 20 people here. I say one word and there are 20 yes. different understanding of the same word. This is what happens uh, because we all understand my message according to a number of stuff which is your experience, uh, your background, your education and so on. So of course when we craft messages we cannot think that we craft messages according to our experience. We have to be very careful in understanding to whom we are talking, to whom we are speaking. Because that is the message that we have to craft. I cannot craft a message because I, I'm Italian and I have a kind of human, humanities background. But I have to craft a message according to the target audience I'm trying to reach. Because that is the only way I can be effective. And uh, because that is what happens to your. Uh, uh, I, I understand that this is not a nice way of, of uh, summarizing your brand, brain, 
but this is how it works. So you have a sensor that filter the information. You have a short-term memory that sees if the message is pertinent, which means uh, I'm interested or not. If I'm interested, I keep it and I filter it down. If I'm not interested, I throw it away. And then you store the message. You store the message, but the message to be picked up again needs to be, uh, let's say, nurtured in a way. So you have to go on that message more time. So repetition is key because one message is lost into your long term memory. Uh, actually, there is a huge amount of discussions about, about how much memory as an individual in, uh, in ID terms. Because that is the only way, I mean, we are used about talking about gigabytes of RAM, terabytes of storage and so on. So, uh, there are two different schools. One uh, says that we our memory is uh, more or less in the terabyte, I mean our brain, in the terabyte uh, environment. Of course, they can, there's no way of measuring it, so it's just a scale. And there is another one that says that our memory is uh, kind of fluctuating. So we have our, the, the memory that we really use is kind of 2 megabytes, but just use it as a, as, a, as a reference, but our brain is so smart that can move these two megabytes around in a way that they pick up from a kind of garden which is a lot bigger. It's like you pick one flower at a time and use that flower and you have a huge garden of flowers and, and, and your brain is so smart. So I don't know, I mean, they're, they're both fascinating in terms of theories. Uh, I think that the human memory is just huge. Uh, and of course then the problem is that how good you are in managing your own memory. Uh, there are people that remember more things, there are people that remember things in a different way. But anyway, repetition is key. Just because if we have, let's assume that we have two megabytes of memory in our brain, uh, one information, I guess two megabytes of memory will just drone into a sea of nothing. So you have to repeat the, the, the message. And uh, there are a few rules that you, we have to uh, think about messages. This of course was done for journalists, but uh, if we replace the word journalist for uh, your public, we have to be fast in our messages just because today we are used to information that are uh, really fast in, their, in the way that they are managed. Uh, today, uh, when, when I started, <coughs> a message had a life of probably weeks because the way of transferring the message from the originating part to the, from one part to the other was so slow. Uh, there was no internet, so it was not, not immediate. Uh, either you, you, you were able to go through the phone, or it took at least one week to get a printed message from the, the source to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the reader. Today, it takes one second and you have a message that is spread around the world. So, of course, uh, this means that we have to be fast with messages, otherwise if we are not fast in uh, creating messages, the message will be already old enough not to be a message anymore. Uh, we have to be factual, we, we, need, we, we must use facts, uh, we have to be frank, so we don't have to tell lies. Uh, Mark Twain uh, used to say, Never tell a lie, you don't have to remember which lie you have told, which is true if you think, because if you start to tell lies, then you have that group of people I told that I was a scientist, and that other one I told I was a, you know, a, a developer, and then uh, 
what happens when I talk to one group, I have to build a story, and the other one, I have to build another one. So just tell what you are and what you do. Respect people we are talking to and be friendly. We have five founding principles. These are key and important. We have chosen copyleft lessons. Why? Because the project was born from the community. And the copyleft license is a license that was born from the community. I'm not discussing about the virtues of one license against the other one. The reality is that the copyleft license forces you to be a member of the community because you have to give back what you are developing. And only if you are a good member of the community you can accept this concept. Because of course there are people that resist this concept because they say, why should I share what I, I, I'm writing? What should I share what I'm developing? Why? If I'm smarter than the others, then uh, if I share, I lose something. This is a non-community attitude. It is, not, it is not by chance that copyleft license are not loved by enterprises, or at least by certain enterprises. Uh, Red Hat is releasing software with a copyleft license, but Red Hat is a company that was born with a kind of open source DNA. Try to ask to a, an IBM employee which license they, you should use, and they would say permissive. Because that is their license. The companies, and again, I don't want to discuss the merit between permissive and copyleft license. I, I'm for copyleft, but I know that there are smart people that are for permissive. Uh, but the reality is that the permissive allows you one day to close the tab, pick up the code, and do not release anything to the community. This is the unfortunate reality. So copyleft license is the community. The copyleft license, in fact, protects the weakest member. Because the guy that commits just one patch in his life, at the end has the same rights of the one that commits one patch per day. Uh, but the copyleft license guarantees you that you can attract people because everyone will feel protected by the copyleft license. There's no chance that you have committed one small bit of code one day and the other day the large corporation comes in, picks up your contribution, makes it part of a proprietary software and bye-bye. So that is the reality of, of permissive license. We do not have a contributor agreement. Again, this is something that companies like. And I think I've, I've been, uh, just to give a little bit of background about myself. So I, I have a degree in humanities. I have started my life by being a teacher of geography at the university. Then after two years of not being paid, I realized that I have to change my, my job because uh, that you, you cannot really live a long time without being paid. So I switched to the, uh, I, as I was a journalist, I started to handle uh, uh, PR for companies. And uh, I was hired by Hannibal in 1980 uh, to uh, manage the communication for their printer division. Anywhere at the time was the second largest IT company worldwide. And uh, so I've been a, a, a manager at Greenwell, and uh, so I know how corporations think about that. Basically, the uh, relationship between corporation and its employee is a relation where the company do, does not trust it, the employees, and therefore they ask a contributor agreement because they want the employee to take all the responsibility and they want they do not want to have responsibility. 
Then we have meritocracy. Meritocracy means that if you do stuff, you are recognized. If you don't do stuff, you are not recognized. So it's a kind of democracy that is based on how, you, how much you contribute to the project. Community governance, this is very important. We, uh, maybe you, you don't know, but apart from uh, having uh, members and having our management, if we can call the management, elected by the members, in addition to that, we have a rule that says that in our governing bodies, not more than one third of the members of that governing body can be affiliated to the same company, organization, or anything. This means that in our, uh, in our board of directors, there cannot be more than two people who are employees of the same company. And this just because we don't want to recreate the situation where Sun was uh, dominating the openoffice.org project, just because uh, at the end, of the situation was uh, yes, but I'm paying pay all the developers, so I should take the decision. We don't like this kind of thing. And then uh, it's vendor independent. And again, the, this one third rule is uh, to guarantee vendor independence. And these are the assets that we have to use when we create messages about the Development Foundation and bigger office. And again, the reason why TDF was, was born are the following, to promote free software. Because if you read the articles well before, most of the articles, or most, many articles, were writing that we fought against Oracle. That is completely false. We didn't fork against anyone. The discussion about the fork started way before Oracle even thought about acquiring Sun. So they started actually, and some, some people were there, we started talking about forking in uh, 2006 in Lyon, at the Lyon conference. Uh, so way before, of course then, uh, uh, I mean, forking a project like OpenOffice is not an easy task, and I always say, that the 16 founders uh, have been so, you know, forking uh, open office to create a project that is competitive with Microsoft, competitive with IBM. Uh, it's like uh, uh, diving into, I don't know if, you, I mean, this is because I'm a geographer. So in Venezuela, this is. There is the highest uh, fall worldwide, it's called Salto Angel. It's 900 meters, and uh, at the end of Salto Angel, there is a small lake. And I said, uh, forking of an office to create a different office is like diving from the top of Salto Angel into the small lake at the end without any parachute. Hoping that something happening in between. And, uh, and we did it, and uh, we demonstrated that it was possible. Uh, but the reality is that we, we were really, I would say, between brave and crazy at the same time. Because you, you, you don't know, I mean, it's difficult, I know the process, but it's difficult to believe that we were able to recreate an infrastructure, to recreate a discipline between developers, to recreate a discipline inside the community, to recreate the community in some areas, uh, all done uh, betting on your personal capabilities. You don't have a company behind, you don't have a structure, you don't have rules. So that's, uh, we, we, it was a positive for, it was not a negative for that is against. So we always have to think that we must give positive messages about LibreOffice and the Document Foundation. We want freedom of the users. We want open standards. We want document freedom. We want a software that is accessible to everyone. Uh, when we present LibreOffice, don't focus on feature. 
feature are just used. They're useful for the user, but they're useless as a message. Because if you start discussing feature, there will always be a feature that someone doesn't like. Uh, we have to tell people that we give them professional software that allows them to, to, to be as productive as they were using a proprietary software, but in addition, it's using standard formats, it's not trying to, to, to lock in him into a software. I always tell, when, when I discuss LibreOffice, one of the things that I say is that uh, if you start deploying LibreOffice tomorrow, in a year you can probably abandon, if you don't like LibreOffice anymore, you, are, you can abandon LibreOffice and deploy another software that supports ODF and nothing happens. And people look at me and say, but, so you're telling me that you, I should use LibreOffice, but at the same time, if I'm not happy, I can change it. I say, you know, if you are for freedom, you are for freedom. You cannot be supporting freedom or 50% freedom, but the other 50%, sorry, you, you are not free. Either you're free or you're not. And being free, you're free to abandon what I'm telling you today. And uh, it's like, you know, this guy, the, the guy was saying during the Illuminism, uh, I might not be, I, I might not agree with your ideas, but I will defend your ideas uh, because I want the freedom of ideas. So it's, uh, I don't know, I mean, Illuminism was probably a little bit more important than your office, but I don't want to, to, in the, to, to get us in, into the same uh, area, but we, we must tell people that it is a positive way to deploy your office. Uh, and this is, I, I know that people that, that see my presentation are probably fed up with this, uh, with this uh, slide, but this I really suggest. This guy is a friend, uh, so of course you cannot take his uh, away his copyright. But this I think is depicts in one image what happened before. So this is the sun umbrella culture. Sun is the umbrella. This is the community. Of course, if you are under the umbrella of a company. Even if you are a member of the community, then the company tends to protect you like an umbrella protects you when, there is, when it's raining. Uh, we, we just reverse the umbrella and maybe David says a mixing bowl, but people say this is a candle and everyone has to row in the same direction. Whatever you prefer. But this is important to say that, you know, this is the community on its own. There's no one protecting the community from the water, if the water is falling from, from, uh, from the sky. So it's the community that uh, on its own has to take its own decision, has to be brave enough not to rely on what is happening under the umbrella. Because if it's raining, we all get wet. So that's the... And this is important because people has to understand that we are a different project. We are independent. And independence from us is really a key asset. We don't want any company to come in and say, you know, it would be better to do this this way. Uh, if they're very smart, they can convince us that that should be the, the, the way. But it's not because they have more shares or more power or more money. It's because they're smarter. If they're smarter, that's a fair contribution to the project. If they're not smarter and just more powerful, sorry, there are other projects that like to be driven by a company. You can go there. And uh, this is something that I use when I show, uh, in some cases, the, this is a graffiti, it's a real one. Uh, you can, you're free to, to rewrite this in a, in a slide. But uh, when people say, but why should I change? Because change, you always change for the better. In your life, when you, 
you, you had to, to grow, to make a positive decision, it was usually a change. Uh, status quo never brings you further. A career is not based on just doing the same thing, you know, the same stuff for 50 years. It's usually based on changing what you're doing, uh, taking tough decisions, changing, uh, changing your mindset, uh, changing the way you see things. Why should I change? Because the only way you can improve your situation is by changing it. If you go on with the situation that you have today, you definitely know what happens, but there's no chance that you will have will be able to improve that. There's no chance that you will be able to improve that. Of course, change, you have resistance to When you have change, you have resistance to change. Unfortunately, it comes for free with change. Uh, but resistance to change is a challenge that we can solve together. And again, you reintroduce the concept that together we do better things than alone. And I think that no one, uh, uh, you know, all, uh, I have a, 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 an old, uh, I have tweaked an old slide that Microsoft was showing in their presentation. And in their presentation, there was, they said, we hire all the best developers in the world that are working on a product. So the, basically the definition is, all the best developers that work on this product work for us. Today this is not possible. And I would say, I definitely prefer to say, all the best developers that work on this pro product do not work for us, work with us. Which is a subtle change, but they work with us because they're motivated and they see a future in what they're doing. So that is, of course, the guys are smart, we have to be smarter than the guys. And when I say about the guys, I always refer about Microsoft. Uh, I've done several stuff. When, when, uh, you know, when the Ribbon, the, 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 the Microsoft guys uh, published the Ribbon with uh, uh, Office 2007, at the time I created the prior, the, the, the prayer of Open Office because the, the ribbon was refused by many people. So I printed up, I printed up, and I even did it that in public. So I had a, an, enti an entire audience standing up and saying, because the prayer you have to stand up. So the, you stand up, you take a printout of uh, the screenshot of the ribbon, you put that in front of you. Then you look in the direction of uh, Redmond, that now, so Redmond now should be more or less in that direction. And then you, you, you and, and I had kind of 500 people doing that, so thank you Microsoft in the direction of Redmond. Of course, yeah, I mean, that creates, of course it's, a, it's totally idiot, I understand. But this creates, people remember this kind of stuff, because of course if they look you, uh, and, and you know, why should I stand? Then they, all the people that stand and say thank you Microsoft by looking at Redmond, then they will never forget that, that specific moment. So we have to be smart in this way, we have to be creative, we have to outsmart the marketing people at Microsoft because it's possible. Uh, this was a, our first tagline. You know that that was left on our week by an anonymous guy. What was fantastic. Freedom, freedom never tasted so sweet. This is the, the first pictures that we printed for Foston 2011. And it's, I think it's fantastic. And we, we, again, we can use that. You know, it, it's distracting because sweet and it's sweet and sweet and it's nice. Uh, and uh, community, of course, the community with unity. Uh, people is not used to community. Uh, I can tell one, I will tell a, a story about a comment that Sonia made. I discovered that one year after we met for the first time. Uh, 
uh, we met in June 2010, 11, 12. 12. So uh, actually, what happened is that Osvaldo, who's that gentleman, uh, called me one day on, on my mobile and, and told me, Italo, Regione Umbria would like to migrate to, to the office. What are you doing? You said, tomorrow I'm in Perugia. So I'm, I, don't, I, I don't think, actually, I was born in Umbria, and this is the reason why Libra Italia is based in Umbria. Uh, and, uh, but I live in Milan. I've been living in Milan for 40 years. So I think one week after, we met in Perugia, and I never met Sonia before. I, I was already in touch with Marina. I knew Osvaldo for a couple of years yet. And I remember that we met, and I was discussing the importance of the community and so on. And Sonia was listening. So one year after, in a, in a, in a presentation, Sonia said, the first time that I met Italo, I thought that he was coming here to sell LibreOffice. And uh, I probably never, I mean, I'm not a salesman, although I'm a salesman, we all sell our carpets anyway. But uh, I, I was selling the community, I was not selling the product. So I probably thought during the first meeting how important it was to become part of the community, to interact with the community. And this is something that makes us different. It's a message that makes us different. Because if you get a guy from Microsoft, he will tell you that you have to buy the license and uh, then uh, you have the, the license you have to support and the license, uh, there is a kind of license that is a yearly one and the, so we can be different by working on this kind of concepts. And I think it's important. This is a way, I always say that the, these are, this is a picture of the developers of LibreOffice in September 2010 because there were not many more than that. Uh, just trying to use messages or clues that are uh, disrupting in the mind of, your, of the other people. Of course, if you, if you, if you create a, a slide where you put the name of the 20 developers, it's not as, as effective as this one. Because the names will be forgotten after five minutes, but these slides, uh, actually the original one, the, there was no developers. I just counted the people said, this is developers, so I substituted the letters. I don't remember what was written. Uh, it, it, it happened three years ago, so four years ago, so that's... Uh, uh, and the icons, when, when I use LibreOffice, I always use the icons. I don't use the logo because that is gives you the complexity of the of, or the completeness of the of the program. So, and this is I mean, I think in, in half an hour you cannot tell everything, but I think uh, I I wanted to give you a little bit of clues about how to use and to create messages about LibreOffice when you will be presenting LibreOffice in different situations, because there will be different situations, use a lot of visuals, use visuals because that is something that is remembered. If you have questions, otherwise I have the storytelling just immediately after, so that's, uh, uh, some people start thinking that I, uh, half of the conference is done by myself, but uh, it's just because I want to share stuff that I think is important because otherwise I'm the only one that goes around and does the jolly for LibreOffice which is part of my of my role of course but I think it's important that other people do the, do the same in other markets and in other geographies otherwise it's only myself I mean I can be I, I'm really and I, I don't have any problem in being the face of the project in a sense but it's wrong that just one person is the face of the project so if you have a question about messaging, okay, otherwise, if you want to listen about storytelling, stay here, if not, go away.
together with the 